Power's coming in. Power's set. Full pressure's in the green. Airspeed's coming alive. A little bit slower. We got some wind today. And it's pretty gusty out. I'm gonna force it on the ground. We're gonna rotate slightly late just because of these winds. There it is. If you want to be a safe pilot, you need to have a good understanding of the weather you'll be dealing with before you go fly. So today, I want to explain some aviation weather products you need to know how to use. When it comes to weather products, there's a lot of places you can get your information. A lot of people like 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF. If you have ForeFlight, it's really easy to get all the information you need. But it's important to know that ForeFlight doesn't actually make all these products. They actually come from the National Weather Service, so even if you use ForeFlight, you should really take the time to look at these websites and understand how to use some of their products for flight planning. Now, if you didn't already know, the National Weather Service has its own website specifically for pilots called aviationweather.gov. And if we pull up this website, you can see that there's a lot of useful information on here. But today, I'm just going to show you some of the main products you should be using when you fly. I'm also going to go into a lot of detail on how to read the winds aloft data, which you're going to be using a lot when you do your cross-country planning. And even if you have ForeFlight, you need to know how to do this because the DPE might have you do this on your check ride. I'm also going to go into a lot more detail on some of the aviation forecast charts and how to read them. But first, let's go back to the home page and take a look at where you can get your TAFs and METARs. And as you can see, they've made things super easy on us here. There's a tab for each of them on the home screen. Let's click on the METAR tab and check it out. Now let's slide down here to this little spot that says Request METAR Data. Now you can just type in whatever airport identifiers you want and search for them. Let's see, let's try KTUL, KICT, and KMEM. Now I like to click this Include TAF button and it will give you the TAFs and METARs at the same time. Then we'll just click this button that says Get METAR Data. And as you can see, we have the most up-to-date METARs and TAFs for each airport. The METARs are at the top and the TAFs are right below that. Then if we go back to the home screen, you can click the TAFs button here. And as you can see, you can get the same information that way as well. And I'm not going to explain how to read these today because I did that in the last video. If you don't want to watch that, I'll put a link in the description for you. Okay, now that I've shown you that, let's find the winds aloft tables and discuss how to read those. Let's go up here to the forecast tab, then down to the winds slash temps. Then we'll scroll down to this chart that says wind slash temps data. As you can see, if you hover over the map, a lot of this data is grouped by region. So just click on the area where you're going to be flying. And I'll go ahead and click on this south central region because that's where I'm going to be flying today. And now you'll notice there's a bunch of raw data in here. Don't worry, it's not as bad as it looks and you only need a tiny part of the information on this screen. And you don't really need to check this every time you go fly. You'll mainly only be using this when you go to plan your cross country flights. You might also consider using it if you suspect there's some wind shear when you're flying. Hopefully I can talk more about that in an upcoming episode. And like I said, this information is mainly used for cross-country planning, but you're also likely to get asked how to read this on your written exam. Okay, before I explain how to read this, let's make sure we're getting the right data here. Most of us here are going to be using the low-level wind data. Then make sure you choose the appropriate time. I'll choose this one because that's when I'll be flying. And this is based on the map we clicked on earlier. Okay, so now we see that this information was observed on the 3rd of the month at 1200 Zulu, and it's current until the 4th day of the month at 0 hundred Zulu. The time we'll be flying is in between these, so this is the wind data that we need. And this is just telling you that they're too lazy to put a minus sign on the temperatures at the last few columns. Now we'll just scroll down to the closest airports where we'll be flying and pick the altitude that we'll be flying at. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit and take a closer look at the forecasted winds aloft. Let's say we're flying somewhere near Adams Field or LIT. Now, as you can see, there are a few altitudes to choose from. We want to select the closest altitude to the altitude we're flying at. As you can see, we can pick 3,000, 6,000, 9,000, and so on. So let's say I'll be flying close to 6,000 feet. This is the column I would use. Next, we want to choose the airport we're going to be closest to. So I'll move across from LIT to this little grouping of information in the 6,000 foot column. Now the first two numbers in this group of information is the wind direction, but you have to add a zero to the end of that. So the wind direction in this example is 210 or 210 degrees out of the southwest. Now one thing to keep in mind on these wind directions is that the direction is relative to true north, not magnetic north. And this is actually true with a lot of other wind products like TAFs, METARs, and surface analysis charts. ATIS broadcasts, ASOS and AWOS, and wind data that ATC gives you will be in reference to magnetic north. 
Now these second two digits here are the wind speed, and these are in knots, just as all speeds in aviation should be. I hate reading those older gauges in miles per hour. That drives me nuts. So now you can see that our wind speed at 6,000 feet MSL is 210 at 19 knots. And this is really important to know when you're planning a cross-country flight, because if I'm traveling on a heading of 210 and my indicated airspeed is 100 knots, my speed over the ground is now only 81 knots. This is what we call our ground speed. If my ground speed is slower, that means it will take me longer to get to my destination. And we need to know how long it will take to get there so we don't run out of fuel. Now occasionally, you might see the wind data shown with a 9900 like we do here at KBNA in Memphis. This is just letting you know that the wind here at this altitude is variable and less than 5 knots. Alright, so now if we look back at our data, you'll see that there are two more numbers here with the plus or minus sign in front of them. This is the temperature of the air at that altitude in Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Pilots don't use Fahrenheit and quite frankly, I wish we'd abolish it altogether. So that means our temperature at 6,000 feet above Adams Field is expected to be positive 10 degrees Celsius. Notice here at Memphis at 12,000 feet MSL, the temperatures are expected to be a negative 2. That's how simple these are to read. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this note just lets us know that all these temps in the columns above 24,000 feet are negative. So above Adams Field at 34,000 feet, the temperature is negative 52 degrees. I guess they just didn't want to deal with that minus sign. Oh yeah, and for some reason, they don't usually put a temperature on this 3,000 foot column. This is close enough to the surface that you could just grab the METAR and calculate the temperature using a standard lapse rate. Do you remember what that is? Smash like if you do. Alright, now let's go into a little bit more detail on the aviation forecast. Let's click on this forecast tab again, and then scroll down to the aviation forecast tab and see what's in here. Now if you watched my video on the weather basics, this aviation surface forecast probably looks familiar to you but I didn't really explain a lot of what these symbols and colors mean. So let's go ahead and take a few minutes to do that now. These aviation forecasts are really handy because you can get a pretty decent picture of the weather even if you're flying somewhere where there's no TAFs or METARs. When you look at these forecast charts, there are basically two different types. The aviation surface forecast, which is what you see here, gives us a good idea of the weather on the surface, while the aviation cloud forecast is great because it can help you determine if you're going to be able to fly VFR because it gives you a good picture of what the clouds are going to look like. Alright, let's go back to aviationweather.gov and talk about some things. Now that we've pulled up this chart, you can see right now that we have the aviation surface forecast selected. And there are actually a few options here at the top. And if we wanted to take a look at our cloud forecast, we could click right here and get a really good look at the clouds across the U.S. We'll discuss this more in a minute, but let's go back to the surface forecast for now. And as you can see, we can zoom in to different regions and get a more detailed picture of the weather situation. But for now, we'll just take a look at the continental United States. Now one other thing that's really important when you're looking at these charts is to pick the correct time. The weather can change a lot in just a few hours, so make sure you're getting good information. Let's say I'll be flying in the next three hours. This is the chart I want to look at. Now let's talk about some of these symbols. So the first thing I notice when I look at one of these charts are the wind barbs. These are great because they give you a good picture of the wind speed and direction, no matter where you are in the country. As I've mentioned in my weather basics video, these little flags seem to fly backwards and the end without the flag is the direction the wind is moving. For example, the winds here in central New Mexico are coming almost directly from the west. Down in central Texas, winds are out of the south, maybe slightly out of the southeast. Once again, we always reference where the winds are coming from. I'm sure someone here didn't know that before watching this video. Okay, now for the wind speeds, you need to look at these little flags at the top of the pole. One line represents 10 knots of wind. A small line represents 5 knots of wind. A triangle shaped pennant represents 50 knots. So to get the wind speed, we add all these up to get the total. In this example, the wind speed is 65 knots because 50 plus 10 plus 5 equals 65. What about this one? I know for the 10 knot line and the 5 knot line, it might be tough to tell the difference when there's only one line. That's why if there's only 5 knots of wind, they don't put the line all the way at the end of the flagpole. That makes things a little bit easier. Now on some of these charts, you may see red flags on the wind barbs. These represent gusts. So for example, it looks like the winds in South Carolina are going to be out of the northwest at 5 knots, gusting to 15. Seems like pretty decent winds for practicing touch and goes to me. Looks like here in Oklahoma City area, winds will be out of about 190 at 20 knots, gusting to 30. That sounds like even more fun. Do you have any strategies for combating gusty winds on landing? Let me know what they are in the comments below. I'd like to share some of mine in a future episode. There you go, right there. There you go. Good, 
Good corrections. Our traffic, Phenom 816 with Fox, two mile final, runway 23, Good man, that was, that was actually really good. Now let's take a look at these shaded areas. To make things easy, you'll notice here that there's a key at the bottom. As you can see up here over Lake Superior, we have this purple shaded area. This lets us know that we can expect visibility between zero and one statute miles. Pink areas like this means light IFR with visibility between one and three statute miles. Blue lets us know that visibility is between 3 and 5 statute miles. We call this marginal VFR because in some types of airspace, you're required to have more visibility. Then, all this white area lets you know that you can expect visibility better than 5 statute miles. Now sometimes, the National Weather Service issues additional weather data specifically for VFR pilots. These are called AIRMETs, and this stands for Airman's Meteorological Information. Now, as I just said, these are specifically made for VFR pilots, specifically pilots flying single-engine light aircraft. But all pilots should pay attention to AirMet because it can let you know about weather that might be hazardous to you. One thing they won't tell you about, though, is convective activity or thunderstorms. They have a different advisory called a convective segment to tell you about those. With that in mind, there are three different types of AirMets. AirMet Sierra, AirMet Tango, and AirMet Zulu. Anytime there's an AirMet Sierra, this lets you know that you can expect a ceiling less than 1,000 feet and or visibility of less than 3 statute miles in that area. It can also let you know when mountains are going to be obscured if you do any mountain flying. An AirMet Tango lets you know that you're probably going to see some moderate turbulence, and that's not very much fun in a small airplane. It can also mean that the winds on the surface are going to be above 30 knots for a decent amount of time. This one's easy to remember because T is for Tango, and T is also for turbulence. An AirMet Zulu, on the other hand, can let you know about moderate icing in that area. Moderate icing is one of the scariest weather situations a pilot can deal with. Airplanes don't fly too well with a lot of ice buildup on the wings. I remember AirMet Zulu means icing because water freezes at 0 degrees Celsius and 0 starts with a Z, in case you didn't know that. Now, as you can see, these purple shaded areas are AirMet Sierras, so either the visibility is below 3 statute miles or the clouds are below 1,000 feet AGL. I bet the clouds are the problem out here off the coast of California because there's only a tiny spot of bad visibility, and the rest is showing to be more than 5 statute miles. Then up here in South Dakota, I mean South Dakota, this tan shaded area is an AirMet Tango. Looks like this one is because of surface winds, not turbulence. Oh yeah, look at this wind flag. It's showing 30 knots gusting to 40. Who here is ready to go practice some touch and goes with me up there? Now we've got some weird green dots in a few places. And don't forget, we have this cheat sheet down here at the bottom. This green lets us know that they're expecting some rain up here. And the darker the green, the better chance you have of getting some rain. Anytime you see two dots like this, you can expect light rain. Three dots indicates moderate rain. I don't actually see any of those on this chart. A single dot with a triangle underneath it just lets you know that you're probably going to see some light rain showers. Can you guess what two blue snowflakes like this mean? Yup, light snow. And once again, they're darker so the chance of getting this is very likely, greater than 60%. And as you can see, the snow symbols work a lot like the rain symbols do because a snowflake with a triangle means snow showers. Now if you glance up here in New York, you'll notice a purple dot and a snowflake, and this means a mix of light snow and rain. Now sometimes, especially in these IFR areas, you might see three yellow lines. These would indicate fog in these areas. The nice thing is that even if you don't know exactly what these symbols mean, you can get pretty close at guessing by looking down at these color charts. I may not know exactly what this symbol means, but because it's purple, I know it's some kind of watery, icy mix. And I'd be close because this is the symbol for ice pellets. We can see down here that the orange means ice, so if I saw this symbol, I know we're looking at icy conditions. This particular symbol means light freezing rain, so let's add another dot and see if you can guess what it is now. If you said moderate to heavy freezing rain, you'd be right. Add a little splash of color and things get super simple. But with that in mind, if you ever open this thing up and you can't figure out what something means, like this dollar sign, just scroll down and click this little button labeled weather symbols, then you'll be able to decipher these really quickly. Looks like the dollar sign means blowing dust or sand. Pretty cool, right? Now let's switch to the aviation cloud forecast and see how easy this one is to read. And once again, you can see that they give you the answers down here at the bottom. And you can zoom in to get a more detailed picture of each region. And just like the surface forecast, you can choose the time you need so you can see how the cloud situation is going to progress. Let's take a closer look at this north central region. Before we talk about the clouds, I want to point out this air met. Notice that in all these clouds, we have an air met for icing. Do you remember what that one is? 
Yup, it's an airmat Zulu. Remember, Z is for zero degrees freezing. Okay, so now let's take a look at these clouds. Once again, they're color-coded, and this just makes it way too easy. As I mentioned in the last video, few and scattered clouds don't constitute a ceiling. Both of these layers are indicated on our charts with gray, and as you can see, they tell you on different spots on the chart exactly where these layers are. Notice here that these clouds are few at 1 2,000 feet MSL. You heard right, MSL. I don't know why they give you these numbers in MSL, but if you want to find your cloud height in AGL, you'll have to subtract the ground elevation in that area. I have no clue what the elevation here is, but if it was 2,000 feet, that would mean these clouds are at 10,000 feet AGL. Next to those, we have scattered clouds at 11,000 feet MSL. And guess what? These are gray as well and still not a ceiling. Add a splash of blue, then we start getting into some happy broken clouds, which are a ceiling. And the dark blue lets us know that it's overcast there. Now, as we look at this chart, you probably notice all these little dots that are evenly spread out throughout this chart. Now these don't represent cities or anything, these just show you the approximate location of those forecasted clouds. Conveniently, you'll notice these clear dots in areas where the sky is clear. That's what this SKC means. These charts will even show you when there's cirrus clouds in the area. Can anybody tell me why I might want to know that? Okay, so let's take a look at some of the other information that you may see around these dots. Now, as I just mentioned, these show us where the base of the clouds are in MSL. But underneath that data, sometimes you'll find the altitude where the tops of the clouds are in MSL. Up here in North Dakota, you can see that the overcast layer starts at 6,000 feet MSL and extends to 18,000 feet. You're not going to be flying VFR over the top of these bad boys. This overcast layer starts at 12,000 feet and extends up to 13,000. So this is a pretty thin layer. Right here, we have a few clouds at 13,000, then cirrus clouds above that. Now notice, these charts can also depict multiple layers, so that can come in pretty handy as well. These are some of my favorite charts to look at if I'm trying to get an idea of what the clouds are going to look like for the day. VFR pilots really need to pay attention to these because we need to avoid clouds when we fly. Let's take a look at a couple other things on here. I'll go up here to Observations, then click this button that says Aircraft Reports. This is where you'll find some great information. These are what we call pilot reports or PIRIPs. These are actual pilots giving reports of actual conditions they're experiencing. To me, these are a very reliable resource for pilots when they just need a little bit more information on the weather. I'm thinking about making a video on deciphering this data because it can also be kind of difficult to read. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. Now if we click on forecast again and scroll down to the prog charts, in here you'll find some more products that you're going to need to be familiar with when you go to take your written exam. I'll probably need to make a separate video on these low level prog charts because you're going to need to know that information. But if you notice, I've already given a pretty decent breakdown of the surface plot in my weather basics video. One more thing you might find handy on this website is if you click here on observations, then click radar, and in here you'll find a picture of the radar which I'm sure we're all familiar with. But if you need just a little bit more detail on the cloud situation, this satellite view is pretty handy as well. See how much you learn just from watching a simple YouTube video? You might as well keep the trend going. Here's a video right here I'm sure you'll like. See you over there.